Welcome back, everyone, to Pink Floyd stage. I am here with Gintara Urbone, and this is what we know about her. Gintara has a bachelor's degree in physics and master's degree in financial mathematics. Uh, during her career path, she fell in love with computer science and eventually became a senior software engineer. How however, she never left the uh, financial industry. Her journey started with a graduate program at Barclays and continued there for five years. Uh, she worked in infrastructure engineering department, playing important technical role in the Barclays public and private cloud deliveries. Then she moved to London to pursue an opportunity at Morgan Stanley and continue her career in banking technologies. After a few exciting years at the hedge fund, Gintara decided to join a fintech startup, Thought Machine, as a software backend engineer. Uh, Gintare landed in a smart contracts team where in less than two years she became a tech lead manager. She is now leading a smart contracts language team and uh, being a part of financial industry tech transformation, she never felt happier. Gintare is also a member of meetup groups and initiatives like Pi Ladies, Women Who Code or Django Girls. Most recent talks were in Pylondium conference in London and Amazing Stuff Meetup in Vilnius. In her spare time, she loves challenges like triathlon, cycling, running, or hiking and travel. So we know about her a lot. Now let's hear about configurable core banking with smart contracts. Work to you, Gintara. Thank you for great intro. Um, so everything. Uh, just to repeat that uh, today's topic is configurable core banking with smart contracts. And uh, I will skip the bio because uh, you did it for me. Thanks. Uh, just one talk about how can I skip this one. Uh, uh, here we see uh, me in 2019, great year, uh, traveling and everything. And this is BC before Corona, 2020 um, AC after Corona. Uh, working from home, uh, here I am at home as well, in first time speaking in a virtual conference, uh, very happy about that and hope it goes well. So about this talk, uh, it will have three main sections. Uh, we'll start by explaining the smart contracts concept, of course, looking into Ethereum. And then we'll move into a traditional retail banking world. We'll establish what are the key challenges, uh, what are the key banking services, and why the traditional banking is not yet ready for blockchain. Then we'll uh, move into thought machine uh, smart contracts, which is the main topic of uh, today's talk. And we'll see how uh, the smart, uh, smart contracts work in thought machine without the blockchain and how can we create this configurable core banking system. So a few words about blockchain and Bitcoin, of course. I'm not going to go into details. Hopefully um, some of you know uh, the essence uh, of these technologies. But just to highlight that uh, the blockchain is a distributed network. A distributed network means that any uh, and public network means that any of us can become a blockchain uh, node, a miner that shares its own computer resources to um, uh, verify and approve transactions. So it can be compared to Airbnb or Uber in a banking world. Because um, we have these um, nodes, um, any, any one of us effectively sharing their computer resources. Um, so in this technology, middleman still exists. It's a blockchain node and it receives a payment for its, uh, its work. Um, basically, advantages of this technology, of course, um, is business to business data sharing, decentralization, transparency. There are many more um, noted by the, uh, by the fans of this technology. But definitely there are challenges and from those I want to highlight a few. Uh, so like transaction speed, uh, because we already know that uh, the blockchain is distributed network, distributed network and therefore um, the, uh, the verification of transaction involves first picking which node of the public network will be the one that will actually add this new transaction to the ledger. And that has to happen a bit randomly because um, if it's always the same node, obviously that's like a central uh, central ledger. So, so that definitely involves additional uh, actions and therefore transaction speed is not comparable. It's way slower than the central ledger. 
Uh, also, there are security, privacy, and regulatory issues, which I will mention later. Uh, but uh, today's main topic is smart contracts, and uh, uh, here we have to start with Ethereum. Ethereum in 2015, uh, aired in 2015, and that was the, the sort of uh, a, a new blockchain framework. Uh, I'm not saying cryptocurrency because actually uh, Ethereum is way more than a cryptocurrency. It is a framework uh, that also introduces smart contracts. Uh, this framework also have the cryptocurrency called Ether, but that's, as I said, is just one part of it. Um, it's way more powerful than just a cryptocurrency, and I will explain you why in the next couple of slides. Um, Ethereum also solved a couple of uh, Bitcoin blockchain uh, fr framework or network um, disadvantages or, or sort of challenges. Mainly the transaction speed was improved by increasing the block size and also there's this new um, sort of um, gas concept, which is a, a way to, uh, to, to determine how much payment would the miner receive for executing contracts or approving transactions. Anyway, so what are the smart contracts? Uh, let's analyze a few examples of smart contracts that, that can be built with Ethereum. So first use case is insurance, travel insurance smart contract. And this use case was actually tried out a couple of years ago with the public Ethereum network. So let's create a travel insurance smart contract where um, the, the customer that wants to buy the travel insurance would transfer 50 pounds. The insurance company would also transfer money. It will transfer 950 pounds as a deposit for the travel insurance. So here we go at the beginning of smart contract, we have 1000 pounds of balance in its address. Now the, there are two scenarios of how um, this insurance smart contract could finish its life cycle. Uh, first scenario is when uh, the, schedule, uh, the scheduled plane uh, departs on time. If the plane departs on time, um, the, smart contract would be the smart contract would be triggered to uh, transfer whole uh, 1,000 pounds balance to the insurance company, back to the insurance company. So voila, the insurance company just made 50 pounds profit for its services. Now, if the plane doesn't depart on time, uh, it is delayed, uh, the insurance, the travel insurance kicks in immediately and transfers the 1,000 pounds to the insured customer as a compensation for its um, for the plane delay. So he here we see of immediate benefits. We see automation and um, aggregating complex business logic and processes that usually um, takes time and are manual. And here we automate them uh, into, into this one smart contract. Let's look at another use case, smart contract uh, for ICO. ICO is initial coin offering, which is analog to IPO in the real banking world. Uh, it's a way to collect funds, investment funds for some company, raise funds basically. So imagine a company wants to raise uh, 1,000 Ether. Ether, reminder, is a cryptocurrency, so it's, a, it's money effectively. Um, if the company wants to raise 1,000 Ether, it would create this um, ICO smart contract and uh, it would create it with, with 1,000 coins as an initial, uh, initial state. So these coins could be purchased by investors. Imagine one coin costs one Ether. Now investors start purchasing the coins, and if the investment round is successful, at the end we have a, a smart contract that has no coins, but has 1,000 Ether in its balance. So what the company can do at the end is it could cash out 1,000 Ether and could therefore collect the funds because it can then trans to translate, uh, sorry, um, convert them to, to, to pounds or, or uh, euros. So, so here, here is the way to, to sort of gather funds. And we saw lots of companies a couple of years ago booming and collecting money like that. So what is the coin, by the way? Uh, it could be compared to share. However, uh, he, the share... Um, the coin 
the coin is not really legally binding the company and investors because it's not regulated field. So it's more like a trust uh, sort of relationship where the coin um, could be uh, could could have some kind of promise from the company to give some perks uh, to give some perks to to its investors. So from these two examples, we can establish now what is the smart contract. So smart contracts are deployed into blockchain. They're deployed. Uh, the, the the code is deployed and hashed and deployed uh, uh, into the ledger, into this database of of the of the blockchain, which is public as well. Uh, so anyone can effectively download and see this code. Uh, so. I just said that this code, but basically, yes, smart contract is a computer code. It's a program written um, in, in uh, Ethereum. It's written in a specific language called Solidity. Um, and this code usually is triggered at specific times. Therefore, it's conditional. Uh, it has different functions that are triggered at specific, uh, for specific actions. Uh, and it helps to automate processes. Uh, I will show you even more um, even further steps of automation uh, very soon. But basically, uh, and finally, it's it's immutable uh, because it's in a blockchain and we know that the blockchain uh, ledger is immutable. So I hope we now understand what from the essence, I mean, what's in the essence uh, the smart contract. So we now can look into one final um, application of the smart contracts in Ethereum, which are, a uh, which are distributed applications. So what is distributed application or DAP? Uh, first of all, let's uh, understand what is a traditional application and look at the picture on the right, on the, on the left side. So um, here we have three tier system, traditional application, which usually has a database uh, where we store customer data or any other data, right? And then we have backend that implements the logic, um, the server logic, the main logic of your application. And then there's a front end layer which interacts with it. And uh, of course, the end customer uh, is interacting with it. Now, the distributed application uh, is also free tier, but effectively, the, uh, the database side and backend are replaced by the blockchain network where the smart contract, specific smart contract, is deployed and running. So how come it's possible? Uh, it's because uh, the smart contract um, can, is, a, is a code, right? So, so it is a program. So it could be configured to, to, to sort of do any business logic you want. But also it stores state because um, we saw from the previous examples, if we transfer money, oh, voila, you have this balance inside the smart contract. You also have a counter parameters that uh, you know keep changing. So you have state. Uh, so you could avoid having database because everything is stored in smart contract, uh, which is stored in this public ledger. Um, so distributed application is quite uh, interesting concept and great way to sort of run your application without thinking about infrastructure or servers. Um, and then you have, of, of course, front end. If you got interested, you could check out this free online tutorial that I created last year. And uh, uh, yeah, do this workshop of a, and build your own uh, distributed application. So now let's move to the traditional banking world and try to understand why the traditional banking world is not yet ready for blockchain. Uh, so few few sort of main reasons I would say three. Um, first of all, tr transaction speed. Second of all, privacy security issues, and of course, regulatory. Uh, let's talk about each of them a bit. The transaction speed was already mentioned by the essence of the technology, and the fact that uh, the fact that there is a distributed network where you have to sort of randomly pick. Uh, the blockchain node, which will uh, add this new transaction rather than you have one, and therefore it always um, immediately approves the transaction uh, or validates the transaction. So, so here you have this additional uh, friction, additional um, uh, actions you need to do. Transaction speed is uh, definitely slower for any blockchain technology than the central uh, network. 
Um, so privacy security, I mean by those, um, is sometimes, I mean, especially the pub public uh, blockchain, of course, uh, there's uh, too much data um, made public. And uh, if there is a malicious party, it could effectively try to find a weak spot in a smart contract code or uh, effectively um, try to look at the, all the data that's available uh, in a public ledger and try to um, act uh, bad on it. So that Definitely privacy issues, security issues, um, just to mention that uh, uh, if uh, there is a 51 plus percent of uh, uh, malicious nodes, potentially the whole, um, uh, the whole blockchain network could be taken over. So things like that, of course, makes it uh, quite dangerous. Um, the regulatory, of course, is uh, very important for banks because they are being highly regulated and they can't really... Um, go into any technology or field which is not yet regulated. Uh, one uh, thing about uh, still still about blockchain is to mention the private blockchains, uh, which of course could solve some of the issues mentioned in the previous slide. So the security and privacy potentially could be minimized. These risks could be minimized because private blockchain is effectively um, just analog to the public. It's just too become a member of the network, uh, of course, it has, uh, uh, this node has to be approved. And uh, the idea for banks, um, uh, the benefit for banks to use this private blockchain could be um, uh, friction, frictionless effectively communication between these banks. Some data sharing, um, as I mentioned, the B2B data sharing is immediate um, or the settling end of day uh, balance differences, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so in this field, there are some attempts and actually Bank of Lithuania um, created um, this initiative, this, this chain, this private blockchain called LB chain. If you're interested, look it up. Um, but I'm not going to go into more details in this talk into, the, into more details about blockchain and private blockchain. I will uh, show you um, how how we can um, skip the blockchain part and use the smart contracts only. Here I want to compare traditional retail banking and a blockchain Ethereum. And I want to compare these two in three aspects. These aspects are secure store of value, participation in money transfer network, and personalized banking products. So from secure store of value perspective, uh, every one of us, uh, we expect when we put the money in a bank or somewhere, uh, we expect to uh, one day get it back and uh, sleep well at night uh, because the money will not be gone. So retail banks, they do provide this by uh, because of the simple fact that all the funds, uh, all the deposits are insured by governments up to um, 100,000 pounds or euros. Uh, now the blockchain Ethereum, they can't be compared, uh, they can't yet co be compared to, to retail banks in this perspective because uh, we know the alternative, the, the wallets, uh, say public wallets, uh, and we heard a lot of uh, stories where, where uh, the owner of the wallet system would uh, run away with all the private keys and effectively s uh, steal the money. And as it's not regulated, it's not really easy to get that back. And now participation in money transfer network is the, uh, is the fact that we want to go to a store and purchase any goods immediately and don't get any issues with transactions um, not going through. Uh, so this is another tick uh, on the retail banking side because of the transaction speed. As we know, as, as we talked about uh, that in previous slides, the transaction speed is way faster in traditional retail banking than in the blockchain to this day. Now, final thing is the personalized banking products. And, and here we think about current account, savings account, uh, and all other things like mortgages or investment products. So banks, they do have that, and they do have a lot uh, of different products to all the needs. However, um, the way they manage these products, the way, uh, the way the technology systems in the bank work that actually implements the business logic of these products are very legacy and they do make mistakes. I will go into more depth on that, 
but here I want to tick the box on a smart contract concept, which introduced a new way to consolidate the business logic in a single place and um, make it really smooth and automated. A few more things about uh, tech ta challenges are traditional retail banks. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, the complexity in end customer technology systems. And here I mean that for a simple product like savings account, in a bank you might have five different systems managing this product. Uh, more than that, these systems might have different data uh, or, or diverged data um, about the same customer or same account. There's a lack of single source of true. Uh, lots of steps even are done manually. So all this makes it hard uh, for, for, for new products to be created and uh, any innovations, of course. The slower pace when it comes to adopting new technologies is, of course, um, still there in the traditional retail banks because of the a hu a huge size of the technology catalog, usually full of legacy or in-house software. And now, final thing to say is that uh, public cloud adoption is still quite low in traditional banks, and that caused scalability challenges and, of course, the uh, cost challenges. A uh, few trends that I want to highlight that we can see in traditional retail banking uh, very actively today uh, are going away from mainframes. Um, who knows, mainframes are the core banking system nowadays, that systems nowadays that are doing main management of the transactions. And the, these are super expensive and need to have continuous power supply. And for cost optimizations, many retail traditional banks, they're looking into alternatives here. Public cloud, so scalability and cost optimization uh, is definitely what banks want and public cloud is, is what they're looking into. Outsourcing technology and also infrastructure. So bank is not a technology company. So for better quality, faster pace and distributing risk, they do look into traditional retail, uh, sorry, they do look into outsourcing. And finally, mobile instant and personalized banking. The, these are the key things that, that banks, they want to change to. To, to be able to compete with um, uh, any of the challenger banks that uh, take over their young generation of customers. Um, so now let's move into the thought machine world and talk about our product and the smart contracts that we have. Uh, first of all, what is the thought machine? It's the company I work for, but also um, it, we are a business to business company that has a main product, uh, which is called Vault, and it's a core banking system. This core banking system, Vault, um, helps banks to go away from mainframes. Why is that? Um, it has the, uh, it, it is deployed on a public cloud. It is a cloud native, uh, but it also uses different technologies rather than mainframes and is fully distributed uh, uh, software. Now banks can uh, start open, uh, start outsourcing their development um, of the technology systems and therefore gain speed, quality and reduce risk. Uh, now the Vault has a central ledger. So very important to say here, we don't have a blockchain or no, nor we uh, use the blockchain technology. Uh, so the central ledger ensures there's the high transaction speed, uh, secure and private data. But interestingly, that vault comes with its own smart contract concept, the financial developments framework. And here we move to the main topic of the uh, of the today's presentation is the how smart contracts without blockchain works in pot machine. So again, the the smart contracts and thought machine are financial products development framework. It doesn't have blockchain, so therefore we skip all the issues like privacy, security, or transaction speed. However, we still would embed the full terms and conditions of every customer product into the smart contract code. And the, the, the smart contracts are highly configurable. They have this development language that allows to implement 
any product. By the way, I, if you remember that I do work in the smart contracts language team, so our team is actually responsible for creating this, uh, this uh, development framework, the language with which banks will write the smart contracts. So just in summary, we see that all the uh, main boxes of the smart contracts are ticked. So we have a computer code uh, in smart contracts of the thought machine. We have conditional uh, execution of, of the smart contracts and it automates the product behavior and is immutable. However, we don't have blockchain nor the code is public. So um, we replace this with bank and regulatory. How it fits all together in uh, the high level uh, view of, uh, uh, of the vault diag uh, architecture diagram. So in the center, we have core banking system, the vault. Um, it exposes, on the right side, it exposes the APIs. These APIs can be used for banks to integrate with their other systems. At the bottom, we see the configurable operations dashboard. This is the place where internal bank employees come, comes in and do some management or operations and administrations of the system. And now on the left side, we see the smart contracts. Um, these, uh, these allow to customize the core general system vault um, and apply the business logic and customize behavior to the system. Few examples, sample, uh, sample contracts uh, we can talk about before we will explain how it all works together. So we have a loan, uh, loan account, credit card account, or savings account. Um, we know that for loan, the key thing is to um, pay uh, a customer a lump sum payment and then expect uh, back uh, repayment, regular repayments. The credit card, uh, what we expect from this account, we expect uh, to allow us to go into um, some overdraft, as in spend up to certain limit, and then we'll be repaying um, this, uh, this balance uh, every month. If not, we get fees or interest. Now, savings account, we expect to get interest every month for our deposit. A few more business logic examples. Uh, imagine we want to acc accrue daily interest and apply monthly interest on accounts deposit. So that was just a showed uh, savings account. If we want to generate monthly balance snapshots and propagate that upstream to the, to the customer, that is a credit card account. Now, in case of international payment, we want to charge customer additional fee automatically. That could be a multi-currency account. And finally, let's reject the payments for an account if there's product specific yearly lim limit reach, which is um, in individual savings account. All these business logics can be implemented with the smart contracts code. In this diagram on the left side, we see product as code. This is exactly the smart contracts uh, that were mentioned before with all this business logic written by bank and they are uploaded onto the vault in the contracts ledger. Once the bank uploads these products as code into the ledger and activates them, uh, the customers of a bank, they can apply uh, and open accounts from these contracts. So on the right side at the bottom, we see two customer accounts, account A and account B, uh, backed by different contracts, A and B, um, being opened. And now the bank can also apply additional control layer and link multiple accounts and contracts together with the plan and supervisor contract. What is the supervisor contract? Uh, it's uh, additional uh, logic that can be uh, applied onto different accounts. So it's basically the same smart contract, but just allows multi-accounts business logic. This concept is quite unique uh, in the field, in the market, and we're, we're very proud of it. Let's go further. And once we've done all this integration, so how to actually uh, uh, how to actually 
use the smart contract so, so, so to apply some business logic that we already looked into. So let's look at how the payment validation would work in uh, the vault. Uh, imagine customer pays at a store. Uh, the payment comes in the vault, um, our posting service, so it wouldn't immediately reject or accept the payment. What it does instead, it calls the contracts engine. And in contracts engine, uh, we would fetch the account that is relevant and fetch its contract, the code, the computer code. And what we would do, we would execute that code uh, and uh, uh, execute that code with this new payment to verify the payment and will either reject or approve the payment. So once the, imagine the payment is approved and once the payment is approved, it goes back to the posting service and that saves it in the ledger. So now after this, we call the smart contract execution again to allow to do additional logic off the hot path. And uh, here we can also do uh, run the supervisor contract code instead of smart contracts if, of course, account is supervised. So some of the logic like uh, allowing for account to spend into overdraft if the customer also has a savings account would be possible here. So we looked at those diagrams, but uh, potentially some of you have this question. So how it actually works, uh, banks write this custom code and there's the general vault uh, core banking system. So how that all fits together. And this is done through the hooks concept. Hooks are public smart contract functions. It could be understood like a contract's public API. So there's a predefined 10 hooks that currently Thought Machine supports. And each hook, it integrates with different account lifecycle event. So now banks would write the code, the contract code with these hooks defined. And hooks, they can ask for data, request data to be uh, presented to them or instruct some actions and or instruct some actions. Uh, let's look into more depth of how this hook execution works. Um, we now at the part where we executing the smart contract uh, after the payment has been accepted. And the engine calls the uh, fetches the contract and account, and that calls the smart contract code. In the smart contract code, let's see the first function, which is on payment accept. That is the function we will be calling when we are um, after the payment has been accepted. And here we see that function is actually asking to submit yet another payment. This could be an example of us adding the fee after the payment, uh, when the payment is international. If we instruct to submit another payment, that calls back to the engine and therefore the posting service and adds one more payment to the ledger. So here we see this integration with the smart arbitrary smart contract code and the general core banking system few key concepts of the of the contracts of the smart contracts are the obviously the mentioned hooks and uh, the contracts api uh, and i want to just point out that there are a few groups of these uh, there is a group of life cycle events so mm, these hooks uh, that are related to account life cycle are for example when you open an account or close an account or other actions so then you would be calling these hooks. Scheduled event hooks are hooks that sh just would run at specific predefined times. Um, for example, interest payments every month. Um, finally, the payment event hooks, and these are the ones that we just looked at a couple of slides ago, is just when there's new payments coming in. Another concept of smart contracts uh, in Hawk Machine is the contract parameters. It's very important to say that not everything is hard coded into smart contracts code. There are, uh, you, you don't want to hard code the interest rate or fee amount or any specific values. Um, so for that, there's a contract parameter concept where you don't need to hard code uh, some values that can be changing. And finally, to say that um, 
the smart contracts language that uh, we create is a subset of, of Python. It's effectively a um, limited version of Python and with, of course, additional customized uh, methods and objects. And uh, that is obviously running securely and isolated in the, in the vault. Um, last interesting thing to say about smart contracts in Thought Machine is the simulation framework. Was, what is the simulation? So simulation is a way to sort of run the smart contract code in isolation and run it for a certain period of times, say 10 years or something, and uh, inject some data, of course, and then run it for some period of time. And then we would be, uh, we would be receiving an output of this execution, um, data that smart contract instructed or produced and therefore, we could test the smart contract product. We could forecast the behavior in the future. So how much, uh, so how much, for example, customer could save with the specific interest rate on a specific deposit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we can calculate adjustments uh, with the past alternative configuration. Um, so to summarize the benefits of the smart contracts. Um, obviously, automation, allowing to to sort of automate fees, customer notifications, payments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then the single source of true for all customer-facing terms and conditions logic. We also have business logic and systems logic segregation. Um, the business logic is the smart contract, and systems logic is um, the vault because it it cares only about uh, doing fast transactions and reliable transactions. Um, unlimited capabilities to create new products and uh, the simulation, forecasting and testing product behavior. Hope that uh, was useful and you learned something new today. Uh, just to summarize the key takeaways, um, the Ethereum smart contracts concept uh, is, is sort of great, revolutionary, I would say. Uh, allowing to automate um, lots of actions, usually financial, allowing to, to segregate the business and infrastructure logic. Now, traditional banking, however, is not yet ready for blockchain adoption, but it could definitely benefit from smart contracts concept. Now, Thought Machine, it does offer the smart contracts benefits in cloud native core banking platform without the blockchain. The, the smart contracts concept could be easily adopted not only in the banking, it could be adopted in any B2B um, service or um, system that you may be creating. So, as I said, hope you learned something new today and got interested. And uh, if you are interested, just check out um, Thought Machine, but also contact me on any of these channels. Thank you again, Gimpada, for a great presentation, and we'll right. see you later. Okay, so no questions, and let's talk on stage, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. All right.